All right, let's look at what happened in Season 6 of Outlander. We begin this season with a flashback to Jamie's time in Ardsmere. There is a divide among the prisoners between the Protestants, who follow Tom Christie, and the Catholics, who seem to favor Jamie's leadership. Christie seems to be the pet of the governor, and they even exchange the secret handshake of the Freemasons. After a riot causes the death of a young man, Jamie meets with the governor and suggests he also be made a Freemason. He anoints all his fellow prisoners and forbids further talk of politics or religion, bringing peace to the prison and securing his place as the leader of the inmates. In 1773, Claire is experimenting with using ether as anesthesia, hoping to perform more complicated operations. Still recovering from her trauma over last season, she turns to the ether for relief from nightmares. Christie shows up, invoking the flyer inviting any men from Ardsmere to the ridge, and Roger invites him to stay, not knowing his tumultuous history with Jamie. One glimpse of this look on Jamie's face had to have told Roger it was a mistake. Christie introduces his very religious group, including his son Alan and his daughter Malva and the rest of the Fisher folk. Bree and Roger take interest in a widow with young children and offer to help her build her own cabin. Major MacDonald attempts to recruit Jamie to work as an Indian agent. He declines until he learns the position would go to Richard Brown. Then he reluctantly agrees. Ian goes hunting with Alan, noticing a fancy powder horn the boy carries. But they are interrupted by Brown's Committee of Safety. Christy is injured and Claire stitches him up, but notices his other hand needs an operation, which he declines. Marcelie is very pregnant with baby number four and struggling with Fergus, who has started drinking too much. The Committee of Safety shows up and accuse Alan of stealing the powder horn. They insist on lashes as a punishment, and Brown sneers at Jamie, saying he should do it. Brown and Christy are really having a most punchable face contest here, and I am not sure who's winning. Jamie opts to use a belt which shouldn't leave scars, something Jamie knows all too well. Frustrated by the events, Jamie visits Christy, who is building a church, and tells him that at Fraser's Ridge, his word is law. The tension between these two men is building fast. Jamie meets with the Cherokee, who requests guns from the government. Jamie isn't sure it's a good idea, but is honest with them. They send two young ladies to the tent in the night, causing a lot of amusement for Ian. At the ridge, Malva expresses interest in learning healing from Claire and begins shadowing her. Claire sees more bruises on Marsley, who admits that she and Fergus have been fighting. She says his drinking is caused by guilt over the attack on her and Claire. Jamie returns all hot and bothered, and after practically attacking Claire, he asks which side of the war the Cherokee fought for, but she can't remember. He tells Ian about the upcoming war, expressing concern that those weapons could be turned on them. Bree successfully makes matches, and is a little disappointed that people aren't more impressed. Roger is asked to preside over a funeral for one of the newcomers who passed away. He ends up enjoying it, feeling like he is honoring his adopted father, Reverend Wakefield. He plans to continue until a proper minister arrives. Marsley goes into labor, but there are complications. Roger goes to get Fergus and straightens him out. When he arrives, Fergus employs some unconventional techniques to help Marsley's labor along. Finally, she gives birth to a healthy baby boy, Henri Christian, but Fergus spirals when he sees that the baby has what they call dwarfism. Jamie visits Christy and says the church should be a meeting house where any can worship, not just Protestants. Christy is visibly upset and takes out his anger on Malva. Frustrated by not being able to punish her, he goes to Claire and consents to the surgery on his hand. Ian talks to Bree about the future of the Cherokee, and she is honest with him about the injustices they will face in the future. Ian confronts Jamie, saying he has kinship with them, and if Jamie won't help them get the guns, then he will. After overhearing that Ian had a child with his Mohawk wife, Jamie decides to send the request to the governor. Convinced his condition means he is some sort of demon spawn, a group of young boys float Henri Christian in the river. They're afraid to touch him and lose control of the basket. Roger saves the poor baby, and Fergus tells Claire about his friend Luke with a similar condition and the hard life he led before being killed outside the brothel. The boys are sent to Jamie for punishment, and he gives them the choice of touching a hot poker or the bairn. Bree invents a spinning wheel, and Marsley loves it. She tells Bree Fergus promised to stop drinking, but Marsley returns home to find Fergus drunk again. They fight, and she kicks him out. Christy returns to Claire for surgery, but refuses to use the ether. Surprise! It's super painful! Jamie gives him whiskey and reads from the Bible to get him through it. 
During a follow-up, Claire lends him a book and he tells her that Brown's Committee of Safety visited them and offered protection. Later, he returns the book with a note calling it filth. It's rent collecting time and we get glimpses of a potential romance blossoming between Lizzie and both of the twins. A still drunk Fergus gets in a fight with an awful woman who calls his son grotesque. Spiraling further, Fergus goes off on his own to end it all. Luckily, Jamie follows him and talks some sense into him. He reminds Fergus that little Henri Christian will need his father to show him what's possible even with some limitations. Fergus returns to Marsily and apologizes. Major MacDonald arrives with guns for the Cherokee and brings news of the Boston Tea Party. In a flashback, we see Ian's transformation from Scott to Mohawk, and he is given the name Wolf's Brother. Jamie sends Fergus on a sales trip, hoping to keep him busy and feeling useful. Before their trip to give the guns to the Cherokee, Bree tells Jamie about the Trail of Tears. When they arrive, Ian recognizes visitors from the Mohawk. Ian finally shares his heartbreaking story with his uncle. He fell in love with a Mohawk woman he called Emily. She chose him as her husband and she became pregnant. Unfortunately, they lost the baby, a little girl who he never even got to see. She fell pregnant again, but lost the baby early this time. Ian was taken to the woods and told to go back to his people, as they believed his spirit was not able to tame Emily's, causing the miscarriages. Desperate to change her mind, Ian storms back into the camp, only to find she has already taken up with his former best friend, Kahiridan. At the Cherokee camp, another Indian agent named Scotchy Cameron is there and is concerned the Mohawk will ruin his dealings. When Ian confronts Kahiridan, Scotchy intervenes and ends up challenging him to a duel. After things settle, Jamie and Ian have a lovely moment where Ian shares his concerns for the soul of his lost daughter he calls Ishabel. Jamie prays with him that his own lost daughter Faith would find her in heaven. Jamie also attempts to give Chief Bird a warning about what Bree told him about their future. Ian gives Kahiridan his uncle's gun so he has a fighting chance and stops Scotchy from cheating in the duel. At the ridge, Claire is practicing using ether with Lizzie and the twins, teaching Malva to hold the mask. She has officially named Malva her apprentice, but Malva spends a lot of her time creeping around and spying on people, even Claire and Jamie being intimate. Jamie tells Claire it's time to choose a side, and he will resign as Indian agent. We get a flashback of Charles Stewart fleeing after Culloden with the help of Flora MacDonald. Governor Martin is unhappy about Jamie's resignation and asks John Gray to ensure his loyalty. Jamie and Claire are in Wilmington to attend a speech by Flora MacDonald supporting the Crown. Jamie meets with a member of a rebel group called the Sons of Liberty. At the gathering, he reunites with Aunt Jocasta, and we learn that she has funded Fergus opening a print shop in Newburn. Bree and the young ladies of the Ridge are looking for a place for her to build a water wheel when they stumble on a circle of stones with finger bones inside. Marsily identifies it as a love charm. Roger has been spending a lot of time working on Widow Amy's cabin, and people are starting to talk. He tells Bree he has a need to help young mothers, and she tells him she is pregnant. While helping Christy and Alan with a church bell, Roger walks in on Malva and Henderson. She swears him to secrecy, threatening to spread rumors about him and Widow Amy. After sneaking out the back unnoticed, Malva visits a cabin and cuts off the finger of a dead man inside. Guess we know who's making the love charms. Gray corners Jamie and asks about his loyalty. Jamie lies and says he knows nothing about the rebels. After Flora's speech, a mob is attacking a print shop and Jamie and Gray intervene. Jamie learns that Jocasta is behind the entire gathering for Flora. She is still mourning Murtog and trying to avoid more loss that rebellion inevitably brings. Afterwards, Jamie tells Gray the truth about the Sons of Liberty. Gray is upset, but relents to delaying the planned raid on their meeting. Jamie warns the rebels, and they barely manage to disperse in time. As they are leaving, Claire hears someone whistling a modern tune, and we see the time traveler Claire met while captive standing in a jail cell holding a gemstone. An illness spreads through the ridge, and Claire ends up sick. When she wakes, she learns that Malva and Mrs. Bug cut her hair, hoping it would resolve her fever. Bree tries to fix her hair, and luckily, she's got the bone structure for it. Bree says the illness is mostly past now, but they lost many. Jamie says they found a dead elk in the creek, and that may have tainted the water supply. Claire and Tom Christie were among the last to be severely sick. 
Claire visits Christy and learns that, like her own, his symptoms didn't match the illness. She asks him for a stool sample, and he is outraged because, of course to him, even his poo is sacred. A good deal of time has passed, and Jamie has been asked to speak at a Sons of Liberty Congress in New Bern. As they are preparing to leave, Christy demands to speak with Jamie. Turns out Malva is pregnant and won't say who the father is except to him. Sweet Jamie is confused, but urges the girl to tell the truth, having no idea what's coming. Malva says that Jamie is the father, claiming that they laid together several times while Claire was sick. Outraged at the lie, Claire slaps her and storms out. Malva continues by describing many features of Jamie's body. Obviously, all her spying paid off here. Christy wants a contract to protect Malva and the baby, but Jamie demands they leave. Jamie goes to Claire, struggling for words to say. Claire believes he's innocent, saying that if it were true, their whole love story would be a lie. Jamie confesses to the time he had a dalliance and their time apart. Claire understands and says she knows he would never turn his back on a child of his blood, but they need to figure out who actually is the father. Claire goes to Malva. She explains that this won't come between her and her husband and offers Malva empathy. Malva bursts into tears and seems about to confess when her brother shows up and she immediately changes tune. Ian goes to Claire and admits his own dalliance with Malva, and Claire tells him about Henderson and potentially others, meaning they have no idea who the father could be. Jamie and Roger return, saying the rumors of what's happened on the ridge has already been heard in Newburn. Still plagued by Lionel Brown, Claire gets overwhelmed when she sees Malva out the window. She takes another ether nap to avoid everything. After coming to, Claire goes to work in the garden and finds Malva there, her throat slit. Thinking quickly, Claire attempts a cesarean section in hopes of saving the baby, but she is too late. We flash back to Malva's confession. Her father made her stand up in front of the congregation and admit her sins, and she spouts the same lies about Jamie being the father. Standing over her body, Alan questions Claire, and Tom says he doesn't want Malva buried with the other good Christians, calling his own daughter a whore. Jamie protests and says he will decide such things on his land and that she would have a proper burial. Claire prepares Malva for burial, but is struggling with visions of Lionel Brown telling her she killed Malva. Because of the ether dream and his taunts, she begins to question herself and her sanity. Ian scours for clues to the murder and finds the hut with the old man who is missing fingers. He also talks to Lizzie, who seems to have a secret. Turns out, the secret is she's with child, and isn't sure who the father is because she's been sleeping with both of the Beardsley twins. When Jamie finds out, he insists that one of the twins marry her. She can't decide, so they draw straws, and Jamie handfasts Lizzie and Kezzy, telling Joe he needs to disappear for a while. Not willing to lose one of the twins, Lizzie has Roger handfast her to Joe. So now she's married to both of them, I guess? Not sure how they think this is going to fly in such a religious community, but okay. At Malva's funeral, the community makes it clear they are suspicious of Claire, who they already thought could be a witch, but now they think a murderer. Lizzie helps Claire remember some details, and finally Claire realizes she did not in fact kill Malva, but they are no closer to figuring out who did. Roger decides he'd like to be ordained and become an official minister, so Bree, Roger, and Jemmy take off for seminary school in Edenton. The Committee of Safety arrives to arrest Claire for the murder of Malva. Jamie is not about to hand over Claire to Brown, and they end up in an old-fashioned shootout. Brown claims that they want to take Claire to Salisbury for a fair trial, but Jamie is certain he's actually plotting revenge for the death of his brother. The Fisher folk show up with torches, shouting about witches and justice. Hiram Crombie suggests that Jamie could go with them to ensure Claire's safety. Some of the men from Ardsmere show up and they stand behind Jamie, ready to fight. Jamie sees that there's not enough of them and they decide to relent. Tom Christie says he will also accompany them as a further safety measure, but suggests they leave in the morning. Bree and Roger are still traveling to Edenton when Bree notices lice in Jemmy's hair. They stop for a bit so she can cut it. With short hair, she notices a spot on his scalp. Roger says it's just a nevis, a harmless kind of mole. He gets them too and they're hereditary. The light washes through both of them as they realize that means Jemmy is likely Roger's biological son. 
Jamie and Claire are riding in a wagon, and Brown is shouting for all to hear that they have caught the killer witch everyone has been talking about. This backfires a bit when one village begins throwing stones at the wagon, and Brown gets hit in the face. <laughs> Christy is bizarrely diligent that Claire and Jamie are treated well. It's almost like he knows something the rest of us don't. They stop at a camp overnight, and as Jamie is escorted to relieve himself, he sees Ian in the bushes. Ian says he brought men to help, but Jamie says running would seem an admission of guilt. The next morning, Jamie is taken to get water and gets ambushed. Several men restrain him while the wagon with Claire in the back rides away. Claire pleads with Christy to go and help Jamie, but he insists that he should stay for her protection. As they enter Wilmington, we see that the town has been ransacked by rebels with anti-British sentiment. Claire is put in jail, and we see Brown bribing the sheriff. Christy gives her some money of her own, saying that God will deliver the righteous and promises not to leave town. Jamie is tied to a stake, and Brown's men say that he will be put on a boat back to Scotland. An arrow suddenly pierces a man, and Ian rides in on horseback, followed by the Cherokee. Chief Bird takes out the last guy with an incredibly cool shot through the hand. Guess Jamie's glad he gave them the guns now. Jamie laments that the last guy knew where Claire was, but Ian assures him they already know and they take off to save her. And that's where we end Season 6 of Outlander. Thanks for watching. Please take a moment to subscribe if you like my recaps. It helps me out a lot. And I'll see you next time.